following interview was conducted with Diana Hardy for the Purdue University Archives. It takes place on December 20th, 2018 at the Archives. The interviewer is Stephanie Schmitz. Welcome back, Diana. Thank you. So you brought some goodies with you today to donate to the Archives. I did. And I was wondering if you could walk us through some of the materials you've brought. Um, what I have are, are the um, folders from the conferences, the Women in the Fire Service conferences that I had attended over the years, um, starting in 1985, um, which that conference was in Boulder, Colorado. Um, quite a moving experience to enter a room with 150 women that had never met another woman firefighter. Um, it was quite an experience. Um, so there's a lot of material in the um, workbooks of the other conferences that I attended then over the years. How did you find out about that first conference? Um, I was put in contact with the uh, women in the fire service through a conference that I attended in Fort Wayne and that was um, that conference I believe took place in 83 or 84 um, and became I started getting uh, newsletters from the women in the fire service then in 80 didn't we see the first the first uh, newsletter was 1982 so and that's it was another, earlier than that yes and that's another thing that you brought was a uh, um, several years of uh, the newsletter that came out once a month, but it was uh, a newsletter that Terry Florin um, produced um, that was that were sent snail mail to your home, or um, actually some of them had a news had a uh, tag that they were sent to the fire department. So I received them. Um, um, and when you were at these conferences, what what topics were covered? Oh, they were um, arranged uh, all different um, interests or um, specialized interests interests that you might have. Some some of the later conferences contained what they called hot. Uh, workshops where you actually saw flames and got to experience um, and receive training from uh, specific people that were um, uh, sometimes uh, associated with the department that was a sponsoring department for those conferences. But there was a wide range of um, uh, self-help um, uh, workshops and um, activities and get-togethers and um, swap meets. Uh, they had uh, lots of different uh, firefighters that came from overseas, uh, from Europe and from Eng uh, England that started coming to the conferences later Later on. Um, What's a that, swap meet? Oh, they would bring um, uh, equipment and boots and shirts and patches and um, Things that were uh, from their department that they would um, trade, trade T-shirts and trade things, um, and you would, um, you know, you made a lot of contacts and a lot of, um, a lot of good people, a lot of good women. It was very important to us in those early years to have um, um, uh, someone to, uh, someone that was going through the same thing you were. And that must have been pretty remarkable when you were early in your career. You must not have known many other women firefighters. So to venture into that community must have been pretty profound. Oh yes, the, um, the first that first conference was very was very moving experience. Um, Purdue Purdue University had. Um, been very supportive. The, uh, the chief at the time was very supportive to send me to the conference. And as it turned out, when the guys on the department found out about me um, um, having my way paid to go to the conference, it, uh, it was a big, it was a backlash. Um, there was a lot of, um, a lot of mean things that were said as far as why I was being sent to a conference that had to do with women. 
Um, and so following that conference, following that Boulder conference, I continued to go to the conferences after um, on my own, paid my way, um, and it, it, that did change at um, later later in my career. So that did not continue. They did uh, they were turned into turned out to be very supportive and and paid for my way and gave me the time off to go to the conferences. Um, what 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 made what do you think made them change their mind? Was it just after you paid for it for a few years they became more accepting? Or? Oh, I think it was mostly the um, the administration at the time and the chief at the time and the uh, the you know they look at the women women's rights were becoming important and and equal opportunity was becoming a you know an important important uh language and and talk uh among at that time and then when it wasn't so acceptable and it was called into question your participation in it at what point do like the mean the mean comments is that like when you're cooking dinner, or is it like at the weekly meeting? How did how did that come up? Oh, uh, the negative the negative aspect of it. Um, they would it was it actually turned out to be a certain group of people or certain persons that were more outspoken, um, and he particularly over the years uh, was probably. Uh, as <laughs> was the difficult one for me to deal with as far as um, his comments because he felt he always felt like or I always felt like he could he thought he could say anything he wanted to me and he was um, was he a rival throughout your career yeah um, well um, yes <laughs> wonderful <laughs> um, that must have been Uncom- uncomfortable when you get this pushback, but you also have to work in a team environment, right? So you kind of well, I think I think one of one of the things that kind of helped me get through it was um, understanding and realizing that I always called them dinosaurs, but the the older the guys that were on had been on the department for many years or ten or fifteen years when I. When I joined in '81, they were, um, you know, they'd been there, they'd been around a long time, and had had had, had it their way, or or, you know, their department and the society and and things were changing, and these were people that had um, these were guys that you know had it had been that way for years, and they were struggled with it, hmm. so it was. Um, it was a change for them, and I understood that too. But yet, it was—I was pretty confident and, and felt like it was something I was going to do. And um, whether I had their support or not, you mean go to the conferences? Yeah, well, or, and be on the department. Yes, yeah. yes, and go to the conferences. The conf- going to the conferences was very important to me, and and that's why I paid my way for probably. I don't know. I, I'm and I. I'm guessing for the next three or four conferences, and and then they, when they real when I they found out that I I realized that you know it was time for me to ask for help again, mm-hmm. financially and and for the time off because things had been changing and my seniority had changed and so there was um, I'd been on the department for over ten years then, mm-hmm. ten or twelve years so. And at these conferences, can you talk about some of the friends you made or how you stayed in touch with the other women firefighters? Yeah, it was, um, I've lost track and, and lost um, um, all, there's some that have passed away and moved away and we, I've lost track of m- most all of them now. But yeah, at the time it was very important to me because I was, um, I, I needed to have um, have a place to go and feel like I was okay. 
How'd you share your stories? Or did you share your stories about the hardships you encountered? Or did you, do you have tip, tips and tricks on how to, you know, survive the day to day? Well, yeah, I think that was an ongoing thing. It, it, that continued and, um, and at one point I had, I did have some therapy and did talk, be, was able to talk to somebody about it. But yeah, it was, um, I think one of the most, one of the things that I kind of used to remind myself of that um, um, if somebody doesn't like you, that you can't make them like you. And I think um, Gary was was the person that I, I it's the first time I've said his name to you, but um, yeah, Gary always kind of was a little combative and, and and I thought, well, if Gary doesn't like me, then that's, you know, that's not, <laughs> that, that was hard for me to take, hard for me to understand, but I grew from that too because I think that women it's not it's not correct and not you know socially okay for for women not to be liked. Hmm. And did you find that you know when you were at these women in fire service meetings did they have parallel experiences to what you were going through? Oh yes, we had um some of the issues and some of the things that came up in the early years was, um, you know, that we would get help from and, and, well, what do you do about this were the bathroom situations because over the years fire stations were built and they had one bathroom. So um, there were workshops on, on how, to, how to take care and how to, how to figure that out and how to get around it and fire departments were struggling with that. So there were workshops on that. There were workshops on um, on um, your health and and physical fitness and gear and having things that fit and having um, um, you know if you were having trouble emotionally or with with something that there was a workshop that you could go to. There was a workshop there, and there was people. There were people that were experiencing and having the same problems and having the same issues that you, you know, were allowed to share and talk about, talk about what had happened and, and how you got through that and what tools and, and maybe some things that um, um, Linda Willing teaches a, a really good course, a really good class on just getting along in the fire service and, um, you know, how to... Um, getting along, like, in terms of... It, well, it could be taught in any in any school, you know. Any, you, it's the same platform. Just like day to day skills. Mm hmm. Right. Right. I imagine sleep would be a. <laughs> I'm curious to me, but. Um, so, so you at the the conferences, um, you had you know the formal program, and then you hung out informally too. Oh yes, yes. And that's how you met Brenda Bergman. Um, right, and so some uh, the conferences. In fact, um, each of the conferences had what they called a post-conference trip, which was a um, opportunity for you to um, relax and and be in an environment that was um, it was all women. So there were um, the first conference was a backpacking trip into the Colorado Rockies. And Brenda Berkman sat at the fire the one evening, the first evening out, and told the story about how she had struggled with um, the department and, and had to file a lawsuit against the New York City Fire Department. And so it was very moving to, um, you know, be around these um, super, you know, uh, just awesome women that had uh, accomplished accomplished so much. Brenda was a, a, a lawyer and had had such desire and and, want, and joined wanted to join the fire department and just had a had an awful time. And you didn't know anything about that, but eventually there was a PBS film that documented mm -hmm. her story. Um, 
but her struggles in New York, like really pushing um, for gender equality in this profession, um, it was a really big deal at the time. And had you heard anything on the news about it? Um, you, uh, I did not know about her struggle when it was going on, because that was in 1982 when she was um, filing lawsuit, until I met Brenda Bergman in, uh, in Boulder, Colorado in, in 1985. Person. Yeah. So you hear about these struggles and an in in intimate kind of sharing environment. Can you talk about some of the other struggles that people had along those lines? Um, well, I uh, if we can go back to the uh, <clears throat> to the video that we have, it's called "Taking <clears throat> Taking the Heat." When it actually came out, um, they had a um, get together down in Indianapolis that I attended and went down and. The, it was the viewing for the um, for the video, and there were some other. There were a lot of the women from Indianapolis that were there, and I think the the whole you know realization that all these women and the Me Too movement that it really had affected affected me personally because of the situations and the issues and the things that I've dealt with and had to um, um, navigate through over the years were kind of came to the surface, kind of made it real for me and made it really, and, and actually made it a little bit painful because I had to, I felt like I um, had to deal with it and and I kind of lashed out, I kind of you know, kind of forced the issue a little bit with things that were then happening at the station because it, I guess it empowered me. It gave me the, it gave me the strength. It gave me the, the, the voice and the platform to, to speak out, to speak up. And when you saw it, who did you see it with? Oh, it was a, um, at the um, Indianapolis um, a, um, Union Hall. A gathering of women from from the Indianapolis area that oh, came together and and saw, it. and saw it together and and were able to talk about it. We're able to, you know, there because there was Indianapolis has its own issues, and so I was um, involved in that conversations too to real to and understood that you know they were having troubles as well. So, do you know when it came out, which was in ninety six? It sounds think, right. Yeah. Um, not exactly sure on the date, but did your male colleagues were they aware mm. that it existed, or did they become aware that it existed? It would be cool to have a viewing party at the station. Well, <laughs> yeah, I was. I hadn't. I had not uh, told you this story, but I. It, I was so passionate about it, about the video, that I made arrangements on my own without the chief. Um, approving um, to show it to each of the shifts um, because I felt like it was something that I myself needed to do. It was important to me to have to have this in the public eye, and, and, and the guys needed to see this. That um, I and I got in trouble for it. I got I got reprimanded mm -hmm. and got in trouble for showing this because I went I I didn't go through the proper channels. I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but hmm. however, they saw it anyway, right? How how did you get in trouble? Was it just a written up yeah. Uh, thing? Yeah. How did your colleagues take well, the film? Well, and and because of the situation that happened at the uh, um, before my retirement, so this was, you know, there was some situ there were some things going on. There were some things that um, I felt like, you know, hey, this is, you can have whatever opinion you want. I don't really care. I, I feel okay about myself. I'm ha I I have no reservations or no worries. You know, I've not done anything wrong. And so, if you want to feel guilty, if you want to feel however you want to feel, go ahead. Uh huh. Um, but yeah, I just I I didn't really have any. There was nobody that really responded. 
to me pers- in a personal way. I gave them, I, I made it clear that if you, you know, I would like to talk to anyone, any of you, any anyone about it or about my experiences if you'd like to hear about it because there was a lot of things that happened that nobody knew about, that nobody, nobody, n- no one knew the struggles and the things that had happened to me over the years. Hmm. Hmm. So one of the other things that you donated was a little wooden sign uh, with the word occupy uh-huh. carved into it. Uh, yes, it's actually metal. Oh, is it metal? It's metal. Who made it, first of all? Actually, you know, I I don't know because um, it was it was there when I showed up on the early in my career. So the fire station at the time when I was hired only had one bathroom, and it was the locker room slash shower facility, urinals, bathrooms, and so the locker room was separated. Uh, with a saloon type door and so between to separate that if 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 I chose to take a shower that I could shut or lock that saloon door with this drop occupied sign and so that's a kind of like a lap too, right? Well, it would drop down. It, it was on a, a, a spring thing, and so the other there was a, a screw over here, and so when you would close it, it would it would you couldn't in, enter the room. Okay. So it would it would keep you from opening the the saloon type door, right? Uh-huh. And so, but on that metal bar, it said occupied. So the problem over the years when wives and children would come to the fire station and and need to use the restroom, the husbands would have to make sure that everyone in the station knew that, hey, my wife needs to use the bathroom or, you know, just to notify everyone, right? Uh And so that didn't work real well when you had someone that was coming in and was was in the fire station for a 24-hour period. So they had to figure something out, and that was their solution. Um, the lock, my locker, where I could actually change clothes, was in a room I, where it had a separate door, um, but it was actually more of a junk room, really. Mm-hmm. But it was at the end of the locker room um, that I could actually shut the door and change clothes and not be not feel not have uh, a worry of someone opening the door. So then later in the in later on they realized you know that we need to do something we need to um build a bathroom so they took that closet that was currently the room where I had my changing room they took that room that was very small and changed it and built a bathroom so that the doorway then ended or the doorway went out into the other hallway, so they they completely remodeled the bathroom, and of course the um, you know the station was a mess, and everyone was you know here we have to change this bathroom because we have one woman on the department. Um, and shortly after that, though, well, it, it, they when they built the bathroom, they built it to accommodate three women. So it, it had good. yes, okay. it had three small lockers in it. Um, it was very small. So that limited the department. They, if they had four women that joined the department, where were they going to put the fourth women, woman? And eventually, um, at the time, uh, later, in, in, later in, the, in my career, there were four women on the department at one time. And so then they realized, geez, we have to do something. Again. Again. And so they took a office that was uh, connected to the uh, um, fire, what they called fire equipment services, which were also um, housed in the same building in the fire station. They took an office away, two offices away from two different people and built a, a really pretty large, pretty large bathroom. And I think there's, there must be seven or eight lockers in that locker, in that, in that bathroom now. 
So equivalent to the men's room, probably? Yes, yes. Well, in one of the stories, Kevin Ply was chief at the time when they were building that bathroom, and the plans... Um, you know, they would share. They were sharing the plans. It wasn't a big secret. But one of the plans, when, when I saw on the plans that they were putting a shower curtain, and my response was, um, "Well, wait a minute. Why does it not have a shower door?" And because the guys have a shower door in their mm -hmm. bathroom, I hate shower curtains. Mm -hmm. And so I asked about it, and sure enough, I got a shower door. Oh. Nice. Or the the women got a shower door, and Kevin Ply used to tease me about it because it was a change order. You know, when you do a construction project and you have a change order, then it's extra money. So, hmm. but yeah, you have to ask for each and everything right. that you feel. Yeah. Hmm. Um. <laughs> So when accommodations, when the, at the first renovation, when they had the three women's lockers, did they hire more women shortly after that? Yes, actually, um, Teresa Biddles was hired um, shortly after that because at the time then uh, there was a third woman. Um, so there was actually three of us that were on the department, and, and those two women both left after a short time, they weren't there. They weren't there very long. That um, I wonder how that happened. Um, was there a queue of women since you you got the job? Word got around. That, okay, it's it's okay for women to um, sign up for a job at the fire department now. And then the bathroom got remodeled. <laughs> I mean, the timing is just interesting. Yes. Don't you think? Like, how did they end up? Well, Teresa um, was married to a police officer that was also a Purdue police officer, so she had um, some connection into the into the I guess the organization into the fire service, and she was um, I believe if I'm not speaking out of turn, I think she was a volunteer also at Wabash for a little while or or started her career there. Um, the problem with Wabash Township or with Purdue is your um, uh, they hire, they hire people that have been have had experiences on a volunteer department, or the military. They they, so they don't have a a way to train, uh, to send you to an academy. <clears throat> so they hired um, people. They you had to have pretty much had to have experience, and so I believe Teresa did. Okay. And. But you being a first woman at. Purdue to se secure a position that that must have really broken down some barriers for these others to follow shortly after. Well, yes, because I think the women's movement and women were um, realizing that the that careers careers that were traditionally male, male dominated were were accessible. You know, police officers, and and there was there were there were a lot a lot of women that were going into a, the male dominated fields across the country, and it was becoming becoming easier. And so, um, after this bathroom remodel debacle, early in your career, when you were the only woman who worked there, that must have been uncomfortable socially to have all the clanging and banging going on it's just more attention being drawn to you right yeah. well yes i guess it's just wasn't a thought that you were like on the you know on the on a pedestal or they were making you a bathroom uh -huh. because why did they build a, a purdue building without without a woman without a second bathroom to uh -huh. begin with and how that how that even happened when the building was built in 1963 so hmm. um yeah i i don't think that that was i didn't feel like you know that i was taking responsibility for that in any way okay and but in terms of fitting in generally and being one of the guys how did that feel or did you feel pressure to fit in 
Yeah, that was a real struggle because um, <sighs> oh, geez. Um, I I had someone tell me early in my career that you can't you can't play with the boys. You can't be on the boys club and and that was one of the things that I learned at the conferences. You can't you can't be part of the, part of the boys club because you're not a boy, right? Mm. But um you know, when it came to when the bells went off and and the tones went off and we went out the door uh red lights and sirens, you know, all those issues that we had either at the kitchen table or, or whatever we whatever was taking place in the fire station, um, that was all put aside. So that was, you know, didn't it? It, it was just the everyday thing because I was I was you know under the microscope and I was you know visible. I was the only woman. I was you know different than everyone else, and that was that was hard to to um accept every every day because it was a big um it was a burden that because I didn't have uh someone that um I felt like was kind of helping me out and taking me and putting helping me putting me under their wing so to speak um so I did I did kind of have some issues with that with so socially it came up more can you give examples of like times when you feel felt left out, or times when you felt like you totally fit in? Uh, and so the early years, you know, they were, they were. Um, I tried really, tried to get along and tried to, you know. <laughs> One of the one of the other women that was uh, that came on early on, Teresa Biddle. She she had a little bit different personality than I, and so she was she was more like to more the person that would stroke the. I always called it stroke the guys, um, and it because I wasn't there to stroke them. I wasn't. I was there to do the job that I was doing, and I didn't. I didn't need to bring make cheesecake and bring cheesecake oh. in so that they could you know, indulge and say, oh, here, this is, you know, I just didn't do that. I just didn't, it wasn't part of me. That wasn't, I, I, that wasn't my personality either. You know, I, I, and so that was kind of difficult. That was kind of like, well, I'm not, I'm not going to buy a loaf of bread and take a <laughs> loaf of bread in every day of, of my career just to get, just to have them feel like, here is my token, you know, grat- uh, um gift to you or mm-hmm. gratitude because that's just not the way I operate. Mm-hmm. And did they, did they like hang out socially together, the fellas? Is that kind of how the um, like exclusion or is it the way what they talked about? Did they talk about like dude topics a lot where you just felt like I can't really contribute to this conversation. Well, oh yeah, that happened a lot. But you know, I I always did try. I mm-hmm. always did, you know, try to be part of the conversation mm-hmm. or try to. Uh, but but in the early years, the guys I had no connection to them because they were much older than me. Mm-hmm. You know, I was I was I was they were twenty twenty five years older than me. Um, but so some of the younger guys. Um, we did things and we we would hang out off duty a little bit we didn't do that very much and that kind of fizzled out later you know i just realized that um things things and you just we just didn't do that i mean you watch stuff on tv with the um the firefighter shows that are on tv that ha- in the fire station that was uh, it was all um fun and i enjoyed i enjoyed that social in the fire station so we didn't really do any i um it got better over the years yeah i did oh yeah it did for sure i felt more comfortable about myself too but um you know there was a lot of question about my um sexuality too that they you know struggled with that and and uh, how does that it, even come up 
Well, and you know, it was kind of an interesting thing that kind of transitioning from the way they looked at me and the way they um, um, were friends with me that I, it, it kind of opened up some avenues or opened up some um, communication because they were able to ask me questions hmm. when they, when they, you know, they were more comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I felt like in the later years when the guys that were, you know, more, I, I felt closer to, um, I felt more, um, more of a connection to than I did. Sure. You know, those guys, like I said, early on in my early career were just not, they didn't want to have a relationship or be friendly to me. You mean like the... The dinosaurs, the, yeah. The old guys, mm-hmm. okay. And so when I did come out on in the fire service, well, Lynn, my friend Lynn helped out with that, but um, because I had no clue, I had no idea that they were um, on to it or knew that, knew that that was going on. I thought it was all secret, but it wasn't. Um, but so when, it, when that did become... Um, not a secret anymore. They were um, they were very open and and kind, and I felt like you know it really did. Be, and and also it it made me it allowed me to feel more like myself and be more comfortable and not try and hide things and not try and be secretive about what I did over the weekend. And how did you come out with oh. the help of Lynn? Oh well, he. Uh, all the, the whole time, Lynn knew because he knew he was friends with. Um, he was from the White County area, White County um, Monticello area, and so my friend at the time was from that area up there, and so they. He was. He knew, and I didn't know it. But um, but didn't you say there was something orchestrated at work for everyone to know? No, he. Um, he finally, at one point, cornered, I don't know even the whole story, but it was like a kind of a, he finally said to me, he said, will you just stop it? Huh. Okay. Just quit. I, oh, I've known sorry. all this time, and I've known, you know, just, it's okay. And, and Lynn, and Lynn was the officer. He was a little, and back then it was lieutenant. He was the lieutenant at the time. So, you know, I just, um, I, it wasn't like I knew I was hiding it, but it was just, something that I didn't talk about. Mm-hmm. It was an, it was my my um it was my own thing. I I mean it I guess it was society changed a lot in those in in that during that during that time too. Hmm. It wasn't such a bad, you know, like oh my god. Yeah, and so when you did get comfortable having had come out you said that did affect your work life a little bit. Is that what you were saying? That after you came out, it was easier to get along with your colleagues? Yeah, well, because I think that it just made me feel more at ease, too. Generally. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and had more confidence and and didn't it felt like you know okay there's I'm, this huge secret yeah 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 that was <laughs> okay and then um so we talked about fitting in what about fitting into your equipment literally or your gear can you talk about how that yeah went? i think one of the um well when i went from white shoes to black shoes and um the gear the gloves especially you couldn't get a pair of gloves that that were the fingers were always too big and the hands were you know they didn't make small gloves mm-hmm. for for firefighters and they didn't make uh uniforms for women so the, um they called me Betsy Ross for the first like the first 6 months of my career because I had taken all of my uniform shirts were um, I put a dart in them and made them look a little bit more feminine or made them, you know, because they were just, they were huge mm-hmm. and they were long and they were, I mean, some of them I could have worn for dresses. They were so big mm-hmm. and long because they were, they weren't women's shirts. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and and boots of course boots were were an issue too because they didn't they didn't offer boots that were small enough that must have affected your ability to do work mhm well yeah you 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 learn to put things in the bottom of your boots and make them smaller oh gosh. you know you, you cut cut pieces of cardboard or or something that would make them that would help help them fit better and what about the gloves well, I, you know, I guess that that just kind of they figured it out, and I'm, I'm my hands are a little bit larger than um, the small on on the larger size than average. Uh huh. So I didn't have some some of the trouble that some of the smaller women that were firefighters across even across the country oh, had gosh. had more trouble with with that with issues like that. So is that did that get better over time too? Oh yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, the manufacturers um, were forced to to you know come up with with an alternative or so, you know get some products out there that that fit that fit. <laughs> um, I just can't imagine because you know you know when you entered your career, you were one of a handful. It seemed like and to. Yeah. To get to the point where industry standards, for lack of a better term, are changing to witness that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't imagine what getting your first pair of boots that fit must have felt like. Mm -hmm. Do you? Mm -hmm. Do you oh, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, you have my first pair of boots, yeah. I think, yeah. don't you? Yes. Just to try them on. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the whole... Um, the whole fire department has changed so much over those over those years too. The equipment changed. The um, um, the it just you know it went from electronic. I mean we didn't eat, we had radios that we called them we called them brick bats in the early years. We had radios that were they probably weighed three pounds. That you um, that's not true, but you so the you know the whole thing. It, Everything was changing, you know. Over a thirty-two year period, um, a lot, a lot was different. When you looked at my career in the in the eighties and and what it was in two thousand fourteen. Hmm. And then, um, in terms of wages and promotions, did you feel like you were on equal par? Um, I did. Yes. Yes, I did. I felt like um, I had equal opportunity for for promotion, um, and I struggled with that because I felt like, you know, I I when you join a fire department, you want to move up, you want to you want to get some, you know, have gold on your jacket or or prove that you know here I've come this way and and I did um, I did have desire to promote and move up in the ranks and I just it was hard for me to come to the realization that for one thing I didn't I didn't feel like I would have had the support of my colleagues if I was promoted could I do the job and would they support me and would I have um, you know support of administration or support of would I be able to, and would I be able to do the job? Would I, would I be able to, you know, would I be able to prove or show that, you know, here I can do this job now? What, you know. How, old, I, how, how did the promotion opportunities come about? Was it every year you? No, it was just whenever there was an opening, whenever it was attrition. So if an officer um, in the ranks would retire or, um, leave the department then there was an opening and so you had an opportunity to apply for that job oh gosh you had to apply oh yeah no it was um, not not by you know anything other than applying yeah you applied for it huh. um but the situation when i first started on the department was um when you t when you talk about seniority in the fire service because seniority is a very important part of the social you know hierarchy of the fire service and so the seniority was very important at Purdue in the beginning and so the officers and the people that are the 
people with seniority had positions that were, um, you know, you drove and you, you were in charge of this truck or you had this responsibility. And so I didn't, I looked forward to the day when my seniority would make a difference or when I would have that position that Bob Smith had or, or have the position that of responsibility and could feel like, could feel good that, that here I was given this opportunity to prove myself. Um, and it turned out that when it became my opportunity or became my time, that seniority was not as important and seniority didn't mean and they did more or less did away with seniority. Because in the, early, in the years, there were times when we bid for positions. So you were given a piece of, you were, you were allowed to uh, bid by seniority. And whatever position you chose to take, whether it be on one shift or the other, if one shift had an opening that you preferred, then you would go to that shift. And that, was, that took place. We did bid by shifts um, for probably a good portion of my career until about the until about the early 90s mid 90s because at that time then they decided to do away with seniority so seniority wasn't as important anymore and it and, didn't make a difference and it coincided what, with the right at the time that you could have benefited yes and, and and right at the time when it would have made a difference that I could have had that position that I had coveted all those years and yeah How so I was kind of turned into uh, there was a period of time when I felt like the position that... So what they did instead of seniority, then they the officers that in charge of the shifts decided where you were the where you were going to, where you were going to, what truck you were going to be on, what position you were going to have, hmm. and then they started doing rotations because the rotations came about when the department went to advanced life support. So we we had paramedics and hired paramedics and had ALS. So we had an ambulance that you were responsible. We were responsible for staffing an ambulance, and because everyone on the department had to be an EMT, you had to then now take your turn on the ambulance. Because back in the day, when you started on the department, you started at the lowest rank, and you were on the ambulance for a period of time until you your seniority moved you up to a better position okay does that make sense so the ambulance is the worst place to be well it's worth yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so they did away with that and so everyone had to take their turn on the ambulance mm -hmm. which okay you know you the rules changed and that's the way it was so that's mm -hmm. that's what happened but in in the period of time in the Late, let's say the mid '90s too, before um, before this was after seniority, after the bid positions went away. Then we had positions that were assigned positions. So you had a position that the officer assigned you to, and then those positions became uh, like an unwritten automatic rule that you moved up from say one position to another and so when it came time to um, the person that was driving um, truck 14 um, had an accident and was no longer going to be on the department so that was yay that was my position to to move into that position and I was very excited about it because I felt like you know here's my opportunity to not only prove myself but to really get some experience with the officer because that was the you drove the officer so you were the driver and the officer rode rode in that vehicle to incidences two things that happened right uh -huh. and so I was um, I discovered that all of a sudden that those unwritten rules um, could be broken and that position was taken away from me, and and I was not allowed to to I was not cho I was not chosen, let's say, to to do that to do that job. Mm -hmm. And and though and the, that's just one of the one of the examples of how, you know, well, we're going to change the rules now. That's not the way, you know, just because 
you know, we've decided that's not that's not the way we want to do it. Well, I went to the chief of the department at the time and made a complaint, a verbal, or just sat down and talked with him that I didn't think that was fair, that I didn't think that that was right, that that was my position, and I wanted it. Mm -hmm. I wanted it. Um, and was told that, no, that's his, that's his prerogative, and he, if, he, if that officer's choosing to, you know, operate his shift in a certain way, only because we've done it that way for years, so now we're going to change the rules. And that, I mean, that happened too. That happened as well. So I talked about um, doing the physical agility test and how, you know, they decided, geez, you know, here we got to change the rules because we have a woman coming on the job and we don't have a physical agility test. So what are we going to do? So after that point, if they, how did promotion? Work, or did you ever get to do the thing that you wanted to do ultimately? Did that come around for you? Um, yes, it did. It did. I was able, I was given a position um, to drive the aerial. And so my, oh no, I'm sorry, let me back up. That was what my choice was. I would have preferred to drive the aerial. And we, as it turned out, we got a brand new um, engine. And I was um, kind of took it upon myself to learn as, learn this engine. I mean, I was, I I had seniority, so that was my position. That I thought that was, you know, the position that I should have had. Well, you were given an opportunity to say what position you preferred, and um, because of this new vehicle, this new big fancy new pump truck that we had gotten um i was given i instead of instead of lynn deciding that he wanted that i was going to be driving the aerial he i was driving the engine so i was driving the engine and it turned in i i guess probably what happened was um i'd kind of i would i would say given up because you know i was it was towards the end of my career hmm. And I really, I wanted to drive the aerial. I, that was the position that I wanted to do. And, and Lynn thought in the back of, in his wisdom, that he, he was giving me a position that he thought I deserved. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, to him it must have been, you know, like a, a, a better, you know, more elaborate or more... Um, a better position mm -hmm. than than what I had preferred to do. But it wasn't what you actually wanted. Well, it was a big responsibility. I mean, and I took it. I took the responsibility, and I I drove the engine for a number of months, years. I drove it for a, a while, yeah. And as it turned out, I, he removed me from the position because there was some issues and some things that came up over the over that course of time, and so. Um, I didn't perform. I don't. There was some some issues that they thought the guys that thought I was driving too fast mm -hmm. or or driving erratically or drive. I don't. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you mentioned um, being weary of going up for promotion or applying for a promotion um, because you kind of doubted yourself. Were there cases in which you did it anyway? And then, no. No? No, you mean applied for it anyway? Yeah. Yeah, no, I couldn't. I, I knew that it wasn't in my, it's just not, I, I'm not really much of, it, to be honest, I'm not a, much of a leader. I'm more mm -hmm. of a, I'm more of a doer. And, you know, I, 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 I knew in my heart after doing, you know, some heart searching and, and realizing that it wasn't really, Promotions were, were not really something that I felt was was me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So when you when you started your career, or did you kind of have that long goal of I want to be whatever rank? Um, did you have like long term goal planning? 
No, I think that coming into the fire service in the in the first those first you know ten years, I was just trying to get and get by day by day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. I had, I yeah, I mean, sure, I would go to conferences and see people that I had met at previous conferences and have them, you know, you can see that, you know, hey, these people, are, these are, they're promoting and they're moving up the ranks and they're, you know, doing, doing, but the difference is, and the difference in, in the department at Purdue and the difference in a department where there's a hundred, where there's 3,000. You know, or or Indianapolis probably what fifteen hundred at the time. So it's a much bigger department. You have a lot bigger, um, you know, things to draw from, and 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 you know, you're not you're not a. And again, I'll use the term under the microscope. And so there were all these things that that I felt people are or judging me or or looking at me or or you know, I felt. I felt like it wasn't, it's just, it's different when you're on a small department when there's only 32, only 30 people on the department. You, um, you're you not, you're more, you're more in, in this, it's limelight. Mm-hmm. So I guess if, if the women that promoted on the larger departments, you know, they had, a, they had people that they could draw from, people that they could, that would help them and would, would take them and, and, and help, you know, work with them and help them. And again, I didn't have that. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. Not that that would have made it, I don't know that that would have made a difference because I was, you know, I was an independent person too. I didn't, whether I had asked for help or, or tried to, I don't know. Yeah, did you ever think about, um, you stayed at Purdue for a long time. Did you ever mm. think about switching to mm-hmm. Purdue? Yeah, one of the, when I went to um, a different one of the conferences, I can remember them doing some recruiting. Madison, here I come. Well, actually, it was Colorado. Ah. It was um, some um, a little small department in Colorado, and I'm and they and I I looked into it and thought, you know, this is ooh yeah, but you know, I'm a small town girl too. Hmm. Yeah, so I I'm pretty I get pretty I get my feet in and. I don't move. I didn't fall very far from the tree, as I've said before. Yeah. So, huh? Did you did you apply, or did you no, just I, stay put? Yeah, hmm. yeah. Gosh. And then, um, can you talk? You know, in that taking the heat film, and 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 just reading around um, the experiences of other women firefighters, uh, harassment or kind of inappropriate commentary um, or banter um, or borderline bullying comes up a lot. It seems to be really part of the culture, the work culture. And so can you talk about some incidences that stick out in your mind? Um, well, and people know that in the, in the fire service, when you're playing jokes or doing, you know, you're, you're, you have a new, new recruit in the station, that's part of the breaking in or part of the, um, you know, (laughs) it's just normal. Yeah, it's just normal. And so that happened. Like the story of when your bed was propped up. Right. That's normal. Yes, yes. And that's, you know, when you're playing, when you're doing pranks like that, you expect that. And you actually, um, I think if you're, if you're not doing that, then there's something wrong. Or if you're not receiving that, then there's something wrong. Uh And there's some, um, you're not, um, being part of the, being part of the, the camaraderie and the, the station, station Uh house, you know, games, I guess. But can you talk about some times when it just kind of felt, uh, a little too much. Well, yeah, I mean that happened many times over the years, and there were um, a situation at <laughs> yeah, 
Um, or was it like every day kind of thing? Or, or would it just be like eh, every six months? That left a really bad taste in my mouth. Well, and you know, I just, over the years, I got used to it too. Because mm-hmm. if they would comment about or make statements or make, you know, com- um, stuff that made me feel uncomfortable, I kind of got used to it, I guess, too. It kind of, I I had to let it roll off my back or, or roll roll off because if it, if it did um, fester and create create some real stress. Uh-huh. Um, but there were a lot of times when comments and, and stuff would, you know, but I would never say anything, too. I would never, like, shut them down or, mm-hmm. or correct them or say, no, that's not correct. When, when Jim would, we'd count laundry and Jim had to refer to the uh, wash clause as cunt clause. You know, I, I mean, what am I going to, I was young. I was, I, it's, you know, it, it before, the, before the U2 movement, you know, that just, that um, it just, um, that's the way it was, I guess. That's the way it was. You just, well, it's uncomfortable to begin with, and then to address it makes it even more uncomfortable. Um, mm-hmm. hmm. um, what about feeling invisible? Oh, yeah. Well, that happened all the time, too. Or, you know, if there was something that needed to be done in the station or something that um, my position, it seemed like my positions were, because I was always the one that was, like, right there, or I was not hiding in the basement, or I was not, you know, off doing whatever, that I was, you know, I was always the one that, hey, why don't you go do this? Or, hey, why don't you go do that? Or, why don't you go take care of this I forgot where I was going with that because the um, story about uh, hmm so I mean um, it's interesting because I'm sure at times you felt very visible yes yeah, well, right, because when something would happen, when some question would come up as far as my ability or my my able to complete a job or question about something, it was, it was put on the front burner, you know, instead of if someone else had done the same thing, it would be like, yeah, well, it's okay, we'll f- take care of, you know, we'll do better next time. Uh-huh. Um, but the one that kind of stick, that kind of makes it um, pretty in my face <laughs> and and I think it was a harmless I you know I don't know even to this day because I think about you know when it happened and and how I felt at the time but a retiree had come into the station and he'd been gone um maybe 6 months and so we were standing in a circle speaking with this guy and another a person that um, didn't know that this retiree was in the station, uh, was excited to see him and came into the circle of friends, our circle of, of firefighters, and greeted him. But instead of standing in the circle, he stood in front of me, directly in front of me. And it, and it puzzled me at first because I, I, I'm thinking... Did he really is he really doing this? Is he really standing in front of me? Well, there was a another firefighter that was standing right next to me that we made eye contact. I looked over at him and we're both looking at each other and thinking, you know, pointing at pointing at him and and you know, it it kind of confirmed um a lot of things that had happened over the years and had, and made made me feel um, unimportant. Hmm. I mean, he didn't even realize that he had done it, and mm-hmm. and I felt like it was an important enough um, um, situation or or example that I had an opportunity 
to have a discussion with this guy later. And it was years later. It wasn't just, you know, the next day. But um, I had an opportunity, and I told him I, I told him about it. I told him what he had done. I explained to him how it made me feel. And, you know, I told him um, the whole thing. And, and it, I mean, he didn't have an answer. He didn't have an explanation. But it made me feel like, well, hey, at least you, you know, at least, this is, this is what this is what happened with me in in a lot of things, a lot of situations. I mean, that was just that's just one of the examples that really mm-hmm. stick out in my mind. Are there any other examples that you want to share? I, no, I think that yeah. That's enough for now. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for um, talking more with us. Yes, we'll be back. Thank you.